So it, it connects a TCP IP port instead of to a file, um, or standard in, standard out instead of being to a file, it connects them up to a TCP IP port. And so you can do netcat space localhost because it's running on your machine, and then space and then 6060. That just happens to be the port number um, that we're listening to. Okay. So now I've got blinky blinky LED. Right now I, I can see I can create a little bit more sophisticated program and start doing some I/O basic operations. Um, and the um, you know, the overhead of this is 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 reasonably low. Um, like if I wanted to, I could set the delay here to be. Um, uh, let's set the delay here to be one. So first it starts at the half second, then it updates there. And so that's faster than you can see, right? You can tell it's on half the time, but... It's a little dimmer. That's about it. Yeah, because yeah. it, it's dimmer because it's on half the time. Right. So it's, you know, you can look up a scope to it and see how fast it is. So what's the uh, command to start? I'm sorry, what's the command to start the here you speak server? The, it's run it's just run this ESTCP server right here. Okay. Um, it's it's underneath. Oh. It's underneath oh, yeah. uh, it's examples a, peer you speak. Yeah, she's got it. Yeah, so what, what do you mean by starting another window to run the netcat? Um, just in the terminal shell. Um, so what you see bash at the bottom. Uh oh, take, hit the plus sign. Hit the plus sign and say new terminal. Oh, okay. And that gives you a new terminal window. Oh. So let's look at how some of this stuff is actually implemented. And I, for that, I'm actually just going to go up to it on GitHub. Because um, I think it's a nicer way to, to, to browse all this stuff. Um, so um, this is this is the uh, I'll, I'll show two GitHub's right because this is the the, 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 the peer you speak that has all the Python and the firmware for it. Um, it's also got the kernel code, but it's not the kernel code we've loaded. For the kernel code we've loaded, we actually go and look on the. Um, uh, the, 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 the BeagleBoard Linux GitHub, because that's stuff that's actually been, you know, integrated in with the BeagleBoard Linux kernel. Um, and if you're looking there, if you look at firmware and uh, capes, firmware capes has um, has all of the different sources um, for the. Um, the device tree overlays for the BeagleBone capes, right? And this is all in the, the 3.8 kernel. Um, we don't currently have overlays for the 3.14 kernel. Um, so they're all just static. Um, but for this one, um, and this is what the device tree overlay looks like. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of information on the web about the syntax um, for these, um, but, but what, it, what it's doing importantly is it's reserving the IO pins that it wants access to. Um, it's leaving out pins that are that are, have conflicts, like the ones that are used by the EMMC. Um, but it is using the HDMI pins, right? You'll see some of these, a bunch of these are actually used by the HDMI. So when you try to load it, um, uh, the the device tree overlay is a modern Linux kernel thing used primarily for um, ARM devices. Uh, what happened was Linux was very irritated by the sheer number of ARM platforms and how divergent they were, and how, you know, how, how complex they were, um, and, and all the, the complicated code that was going into the decision making about the different uh, peripherals that the, each of the different devices um, would have. And so we said, I'm not going to take any more code for all this stuff. It all has to be generic. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to use a device tree overlay to, get, to make all the different weird configurations mm -hmm. uh, for the different platforms. Um, so it's it's just a, a mechanism to move what was once in the code to be data driven. Right, and he can ensure that you know whatever kind of data you put in there yeah. still and, runs. And, and yeah, and because because he doesn't he doesn't want to mess with all this multitude of platforms. Right. So you just make it configurable, and you know use this, a common interface for all the configuration parameters. Okay. Um, so all this is is, is it signs um, you know matching things like. Um, you know, it's compatible with BeagleBone or BeagleBone Black. Those are the ones it can load on. Um, it's setting up some, some elements for, 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 for use. But here, um, in the, the so the, the normal mechanism for device tree is at boot time, 
Um, there's this one description file that describes all the hardware that you're going to use. Mm -hmm. um, device tree overlay allows you to change that after boot time. And for things that you're doing where you, you don't know exactly like what you're going to wire up, right? You hear we're wiring up stuff to the pure use. You may want to use those pins for say the HDMI or other things like that. We don't want to bind those in one place uh, to the um, to the hardware. So one solution for that is to use overlays. And here, there's a pin mux that gets configured, the AM33X pin mux. So we're, we're taking that in the device tree and we're overlaying this val these values. So we're changing the set of values that it has already assigned for that peripheral. Um, and we're, we're, we're changing it to be these values. So if, if, those, if, there's a, if there's a conflict in the change you're trying to make, your device tree overlay may not load. Right, it, it may it may fail when you try to load it, um, which is why you see when we're trying to allocate those different pins um, that it, that it was was failing because HDMI was already using it. Um, but but here it's setting up, um, and and all these numbers are a little bit magic. Um, these happen to be the offset of the it, within the pin mux peripheral, mm -hmm. the offset to the register that controls this pin. Okay. So, um, so normally you would do that at, at boot up, like if you have an embedded system, you would write yes. that out as part of the boot up to configure the I/O registers and all that stuff. Exactly. And now you move exactly. Really to the well, because overlay. because it, now we move it to an overlay because yeah. we want people to be able to develop a bunch of different types of right. systems. So we have seen some things interpreting this and yeah, yeah, the kernel the driver. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the kernel driver is doing that back behind the scenes. Um, so each one of these, like, is selecting the different modes. Like you see, this last, the last uh, three bits in this register is the mux value. Um, so you see, it's mode six. You know, mode six matches the six here. Mode five, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the pin mux mode that, that selects the PRU to be the output on those pins. Mm -hmm. So that's how the pins become allocated to the PRU and actually manage to get out to the actual physical pins. So if this isn't done, right, you can set those pins high and low all you want at the peripheral. Right. You know, in the in the pure U, you'll never see them on the output pins. Um, What's this file called? It's BB. It, remember when we typed um, config dash pin space overlay space BB dash PRU speak? Mm -hmm. uh, this file is called uh, BB dash PRU speak, um, and then there's a version number. 0A0 and then .dts or device tree source. Device tree. It's a device tree source file. I got an error when trying to run the uh, the SDCP. Um, I just ran it right from the interface, like right clicked on the tab. Yeah, that's how I was running it. Well, you know, the module's not loaded. Uh, you have to do mod probe yeah, and the uh, which file? Pen. I got oh, the server running. What's I, 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 I've got the server running, but I don't have the example program. There we go. Which example program does it run? So I've got the PRU Speak server running, yeah. Yeah. and I've got the uh, Netcat yeah. going. Um, yeah. So Netcat's going. So I've got the connection. You're ready. The, so over right here, you can start typing commands. In Netcat, you can start typing commands. In this tab, in that tab, this tab, you can start typing commands like set. Capital doesn't matter. It does matter. It, it's right, right, right. the commands in bot speaker are all caps. Set the variables are mixed, but the commands are all okay, so I can Set the light. DIO. Switch to this tab because that's what the capital. Or you don't have a. I don't know if you have a. Might actually wire it up. Well, what's your look like? Oh, uh, it's on a different pin. These were wired up for a totally different lab. Oh, that's directly. Now you're, it's running. And this is, and this so is, this, this one has a resistor built into it. Oh, okay, different lines. So I just like. I can give you one of these LEDs that has a resistor built into it. And then so I can There's a gray case here somewhere. Here it is. Um, so yeah, you're good to go there. These little um, LEDs. Unplug your. I bought special LEDs. At one point for the for different labs, uh, the lab the last people this was used these boards get shared between different workshops. They were used in um, ASWE, which is the American Society of Engineering Educators. 
Uh, so there's one that has the resistor built into it. Mm -hmm. And they ran a certain workshop. It's probably the same workshop we ran with them last year. Um, and, and they were the ones that left these boards set up. Yep, that's good. Um, all right. So device tree. That one's the easy part. Just now we get to the fun stuff. I think. Okay, yeah, um, and you can probably get everything else. So the inside of um, so the, the kernel driver is right here under drivers um, remote proc. Uh, you see the Beagle logic example. I actually pulled a lot from the Beagle logic example in order to, to, to do the uh, uh, the peer you speak. The student the student did a peer you speak driver, um, but he didn't. Um, you know, he didn't integrate it in with our main kernel. So I, I just needed a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of help there. Um, so you'll see this peer you speak dot c and peer you are proc. Those are the two main source files that implement the kernel driver. Um, there's also this one called external glue. Um, and uh, an external glue just kind of provides the interface between those two. Um, if you've never seen a kernel driver before, this might be a little worrisome. It might be seeing a little complex to you. Um, but um, the, most of the magic happens um, through this thing called a, a down call. Um, so the remote proc um, driver that we're, we're using here implements this, this thing called a, um, a down call uh, that provides us a mechanism for sending a uh, remote proc driver. Yeah, that's it. Uh, um, so this is the, the peer you rem R proc. That's the remote proc driver. Uh, so the remote proc driver, this this is a fairly this is a big chunk of code uh, that gives the mechanism for loading the firmware um, and um, providing um, shared memory buffers for communicating between them. Um, but there's a there's a, just a couple of interfaces that I'm that I'm leveraging. Um, I, I, this code is long. I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time going through our proc itself, um, but I want to show how to use our proc. Because um, our proc, this version is some 3,000 lines of code. So it looks like Peer You Speak is a much smaller, much more manageable 500 lines of code. Um, and what, so what, what it does is it leverages, it leverages down call and it leverages shared memory. Right? So this, this data structure um, is where I, um, uh, is, is kind of, provides all the different mechanisms. Um, this miss device interface, that provides files back to user space. Mm -hmm. So that's how I talk to the, the Python script, right? Okay. So it's, it's using um, miss device to, to, to set up a miscellaneous device driver and we'll create a bunch of different sysfs entries against that, that um, miscellaneous device driver that, that provide you mechanisms for, for calling different functions on the board. Um, down call is coming from the remote proc driver. So I get a, a function pointer here from remote proc, and that gives me a mechanism to talk from the driver down to the PRU itself. Um, so when I call down call, it's actually send, sending a, an interrupt um, down to the board. And as I said, it's not really interrupts, um, but there's a, there's a, you know, a standard set of firmware um, in my PRU code that, that, that is looking for the flag that says that there's a message and a certain data structure to, to say that you know I've got some data. And it just provides me a mechanism. So there's a there's an integer that says what the down call is and then it can take five different 32 bit arguments. So that's the communication between the file system, the programming system, or you know, the CPU and the PRU. Um, specifically if this is the interface between the PRU speak driver and the PRU, the, the firmware running on the PRU. So this is, is this, P, this is not PRU speak, this is the CPU? Uh, this is running on the main CPU. Right. Um, that's the Linux kernel driver. Yeah. That's the PRU speak driver. It's the thing when you type mod probe, um, PRU underscore speak, this is the driver that gets loaded okay. into the kernel. Um, 
And okay, let me start with this first one. You see that structure of missed devices? Um, that structure is what defines um, sys misc no sys devices misc. No, it's bus misc. What is it? Sys class misc. That's what it is. Um, so if you see um, right under sys class misc, right there's peer use speak. So this peer use speak is a miscellaneous device driver. Right? And through that, I'm creating different SysFS entries that give me um, different operations, right? There's an abort operation, there's an execute operation, there's a, a, a single command operation, um, there's a you know, status operation. And, and so with Linux, Linux makes everything into a file, right? Um, so these are the different file interfaces um, that are exposed. Um, so the, the Python layer is taking that, that textual information and, um, and putting it into a, um, uh, um, essentially something that can go into that, um, like it, it's taking it into making a collection of 32-bit bytes that get placed as arguments into that down call. So each one of these, each one of these different interfaces uh, corresponds to a particular down call. Um, so these are each different messages that I can send down to the PRU that take an array of five different 32-bit uh, three-two-bit words. Five. Yeah. Up to up to five 32-bit <coughs> words. I mean, you don't have to use every parameter, but you know, you, that's that's what gets passed. Um, and so that Python code is tokenizing the, the text into 32-bit words, and then you send those 32-bit words down. Um, in the future, I'm going to add to the drive. I'm going to put that that code into the driver itself, so it provides another file entry that is actually just the um, you know just go straight to interpretation and move that down to the kernel. But right now, it's being done in in Python. Okay, so that code that you showed us was the kernel code to send stuff from the file to the uh, right, 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 right. This is CRU. exactly to the, yeah to the um, um, here you've got some firmware running in it. Anyway. That answers these down calls, yeah. um, and you'll see, like, um, like here, there's the debug function, right? Um, so this is this is essentially the, the, the function that gets called um, um, when you read and write that debug file from the from user space, and um, so it's doing this down call and. You know, and it's providing those different addresses. So this is where it actually sends something to the um, to the PRU. Um, and there's one of these for each of the different um, the diff different interfaces: debug, um, init, uh, execute, abort, um, status. Um, and they're not doing too much here. Um, they're just they're just essentially just grouping stuff up and sending it on down. So, so, um, so. And these are this is where I, I register those interfaces with the kernel. Um, so this is a standard macro for the for the kernel interfaces for your creating a device driver, and this is the name of the, the um, I don't know if that's the name of the interface or the function, um, but then there's there's permissions, um, whether or not you can read and write to it. So there's different different options of the of the, the interface back to the kernel, um, and you can look this up in any sort of um, resource on Linux kernel device driver. Right? Any type of priority in that. Or? Uh, no priority in there. Uh, these two functions, load and reset, I'm leveraging off of uh, the main real proc driver. So those are already uh, um, those are those were written already as part of the remote proc driver. Um, and the student wrote all these functions. Um, but I just um, yeah. Are you filling with the firmware in any fashion, or even no on just the kernel? Well, the firmware, uh, yeah. I mean, there's custom firmware for peer you speak. In, for the peer use themselves. Um, so I just wanted to, sh I wanted to show the kernel first. Okay. Um, this is the kernel interface. And show the, the, and show the main interfaces that we're using here from the, from the remote proc driver. Um, that, that down call, and then there's a handful here, if I look at glue, um, I'll try to find out where it is. Um, so this is where the shared memory allocation is done in the probe. So when the driver is loaded, we have to allocate the shared memory. Uh, for doing the for doing the communication, and um, 
So we just have to use this kernel coherent DMA allocation um, interface for, for, for allocating the shared memory. Um, and um, so that's being used um, in two places. It's being used for, like the, the down calls give me the ability to, to initiate commands down in the peer U, um, but I still need a way to get data back. Um, so there's shared memory being used for the return values. Um, also, when I load the, like when I start a script, I'm not just providing a, um, you know, it's not just coming in these 32-bit values, right? It's coming with a whole chunk of memory. So I'm using the shared memory for, um, that's the, that's code. So I say I, but I really should mean Deepak. Um, so SHM underscore code is the, what's used for the, the, the script memory. Um, and then uh, SHM return is used for return values. Is there any kind of semaphore or something around those code blocks so you don't step on each other? Uh, the is valid flag, I think, well, actually no, that's just to say whether or not the memory is allocated or not. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure how he's implementing, if he's implementing any semaphores here. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, you've got shared memory, so you can, you can do, um, you can create your own mutexes. Well, right, in the past, when I had shared memory, especially between two systems, uh, two processors, they, especially if you want to read it tightly, yeah. you run into, that you end up basically figuring out which, what the hardware, which system the hardware gives access, right? If you place two writes to the same memory cell, the hardware might be configured to give one over you know, one always to win, and semaphores are a way to, to fix that sort of in hardware, right? Absolutely. And, and I was just wondering if there's anything like that in there. Because it's really a hard problem to deal with with just software. If we look at the, the when he's got his kernel interface, um, have you gone through all the code or just skimmed it? I, I have not gone through all the code exhaustively, no. Um, yeah, so he, so he's open to, yeah, that's why I can't answer it, because I, I haven't gone through it exhaustively. I only gone through the stuff I need to do to integrate the 3.8 kernel. Um, oh, but he does use memory map and stuff like that. Yeah, so this, well, this is where he's directly mapping that, um, the, the bytecode. So mm -hmm. if you see code, code SHM, that's the shared memory. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see... You know, yeah, but I don't might, think you really you know, need that, to semaphore. That that's, stuff might might do it because I mean, at the end, that's how you know a disk controller gets this memory and writes stuff out to the hard disk, right? It's all based on DMA and that kind of stuff. So if he's just using the standard kernel routines that do that, he's not. He's not. Okay. No, he's going right around it. Um, and and actually, now I remember part of this, right? So to look at the whether or not the return number, the return value is valid, he's using, um, so he maps it into memory and he's looking at a counter. Um, so when the counter increments, he knows he has a new value um, within the return. Mm -hmm. So that's not a good, that's not a good semaphore. Um, he, he should use a better, <coughs> a better semaphore mechanism than that. But, but essentially he's counting on, um, you know, if he, if he looks at the, this, the, this memory value updating and it's incremented, he knows that the other portion of memory is valid. Right. Well, in the past, we had exactly the same, same problem, but we ended up looking at that counter, because we were trying to do software, we ended up looking at that counter too frequently, and that prevents the other side from writing actually the value. Right. Right? So, because you're really dependent on the cycle times and how fast something can do memory access and all that kind of stuff, and it's all in the hardware. Yeah, you, and it's, you can't, um, at least from the A8 side, you can't read and write fast enough to block the, the peer view from accessing Okay. Um, okay. Question so is, maybe could, you, could you do it up fast enough on the peer view side to block it? I don't think so, but um, I don't know what the memory interface priority encoding is like. Huh. Um, yeah, I mean, those are all perfectly valid concerns. Well, actually, I was just asking for interest. I mean, it's not like I have a concern. Obviously, your stuff works, right? So whatever software implementation he has deals with that problem. Well, how many people are actually using the uh, here you speak? Not that many. And are these it's not very intensive production type 
No. This is brand. This is pre-brand new stuff. You don't know if there's not any leaking issues in here. Uh, but this is this is intended really for um, right now as a as just kind of a, of a reference to help get you started. I'm not as a definitive. So what was the section? Yeah. But the I know with the Beagle Logic stuff, it's also using this remote stuff, mm -hmm. folk stuff. I mean that's working pretty darn well. You know, getting us to 200 megabytes per second. So right, right, right. Now it's kind of beast, uh, beaten. So you can do set i comma like here's some example stuff you can type. Um, set that I, oh, the, the set dio four, dio capital or capital right? dio and square brace open four comma one. Set, you know, comma one error. You should see the LED turn on if you loaded everything properly. Uh, is your LED wearing it the right way? No, mm -hmm. that might be the difference. Uh, I mean, nine times out of ten, right? It's the almost. Let's try not to kill the board. Why is it so low? But it's lighting, but very low. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. Maybe somebody burned it out. I don't know. Um, so let's look at the firmware. Oh, there it is. It's not quite connected. Oh, was that it? It came on? Yeah, it's coming on. Mm -hmm. um, Spread. Actually, let's look at the down call first. Um, here's the basic Here's the basic interface for the down call. So this is, if you want to use this remote proc um, driver, um, you need to have uh, this portion implemented as the, on the, um, on the PRU. Um, so it's looking at these, and actually, I, I, I've not looked at this in any, to any real extent to kind of know how it's implemented. I just know that this is this is kind of the standard interface that he's it's um, that he's that he's provided here. So you need to call this in your um, in your in your loop um, to to wait for the for the down calls. Um, hmm. And then you can implement and see the actual down calls. All right, so. So here's the, this is the event loop. Um, so it's macro look for the event, um, you know, clear the system event and then do the, do the SD down call. So that calls that, uh, that chunk of assembly. And handle down call should be probably an array. No, it's a function. Okay, so it's a function with the uh, with the. Uh, so you'll get called back with an ID here. So remember the those 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 five different arguments that we were being called from, we were calling from the from the, the kernel device driver. So now we're getting called those. Um, so one for the ID, and then we actually get those five 32 bit values. So this is our remote procedure call mechanism. Okay, um, and you'll see one of these functions implemented for each one of the different uh, mechanisms, right? So there's debug, init, exec, abort, stat. Um, these individual instructions, right? So if I want to write, I want to run a 32-bit a, a instru instruction or a 64-bit instruction, uh, that's how the individual instructions are, are run. Um, and then exec will set the is executing flag. And if executing flag is set, then in the event loop, get back up here to the top of the main event loop. Uh, where's the event loop? Um, that's where we started. Okay, check event. Um, where's the while one? There we go. There's the while one. Um, so the while one calls the check event. And if the flag is executing a set, so we're set, that's essentially when you set run, um, the script is running, it just continuously calls ex, um, execute instruction. So it's gonna check for new events, like new messages coming from the, um, from the arm between executing each one of these instructions. And so my thinking is that this provides enough of a framework for people to try to build off richer systems. Like you just, 
implement any of your individual functions that you might want to be able to run on the PRU, um, you know, as execution, you know, as, as you know, instructions within this sort of an interpreter environment, um, and then you just kind of run them in a loop, and in between you can check for commands uh, that allow you to continue to communicate um, between the, the A8 and the, the, the PRU. So I'm hopeful this gives people a real framework that they can go and, and build on top of, and also we'll have enough sort of a standard implemented library that we can do to talk, you know, how you do pulse width modulation, how you do reading from the A to D converters, how you do the, the different digital I.O., um, that you can use all those library functions to kind of expand this firmware to do whatever it is you need. Um, and this is all compiled. Um, I installed the, uh, the TI uh, compiler. Um, if I have the firmware installed here, like the, the TIC. Um, it's under uh, opt uh, peer U. So what was the line that installed the code, the firmware? Uh, the install of the firmware is the make file that's in here. You look at this make file. So, so sorry, the firmware is already. I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Preloaded on these boards. It's preloaded. Is it preloaded as part of the build or? Uh, it's preloaded as part of this this magical SD card. Okay. Um, um, otherwise, what you need to do is download it from here from the, the peer you speak and do the make file. But you'll need to install the TIC compiler, um, which gives you this uh, shell script installer. So if you look for the if you download the compiler, it makes you. Uh, in the future, we will ship with the C compiler on it. In fact, I'm supposed to be getting it within a month so that I can actually ship the TIC compiler on it. Um, ideally, I'd have both the TIC compiler and the GCC compiler. Um, What's the difference? Who wrote it? Open source. GCC is open source. C compiler for open source projects. Right, but what, what additional features? You said you need, you need, you need to use the TI. Oh no, I don't know that you need to use the TIC compiler, it just happens to be that I used it. So you're not sure. But yeah, I just, I just haven't tried the GCC. If I find the GCC works well enough, I, the only thing, the thing that I want to ship with the TIC compiler is I expect it to provide a certain degree of optimization and testing across a, a lot of different things um, that maybe the GCC compiler wouldn't. Um, you know, so different code would probably run better than one or the other. Like if it's if you're pulling open source packages from a lot of places, GCC would probably be the better compiler for a lot of it. If you're pulling the TI example code and other stuff that's specifically targeting the PRU, the TI and PRU C compiler. Remember, you only got 8K for code, so you don't want to pull too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I've been talking to the uh, the Tiny G folks about porting their um, their control system stuff to it, and theirs is in, apparently it's in C++. <laughs> Uh -huh. Control. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's not insane. It's just unfortunate. Yeah, as long as it doesn't use STL. So here, there's if you see if you see the TI downloads, there's a an A8 download um, for the peer use. So that actually runs on the the Beagle itself, and it makes you log in. So you have to have a TI ID. Um, anybody can get one, but they use this for export control. They're getting rid of this. They're about to release a version that's freely redistributable. And I'm told before the end of October. Oh my goodness, I don't really have to. So I can, I don't want other people to have to deal with this. Yes, government. My company, Texas Insurance, how about that? <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> Afghanistan, I think they've opened up the door. I think they want to do, uh, I'm pretty sure this is going to be used for uh, sure. military. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guarantee I'm not going to use it to create missiles. Yeah, well, can you guarantee that we're not going to do it? Yeah. <laughs> You've given us that code here. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but what you end up downloading is this uh, shell script. Um, it's .sh file, um, and which again has another click wrap. Um, and once you get it installed, it looks like uh, um, it, it expands in the root directory, but I just moved it into opt. There's a, there's a couple of magic parameters um, to be able to use it. And by that, I mean um, you need to put it in path. If you put it in, uh, if you put it in uh, slash opt here, you know, it says not in the path by default, so you need to do uh, uh, export path equal dollar sign path. Hopefully, you know, you guys know mostly how to do this. But opt here, you then so you need to put the then in the path. And then you also need to set these variables called adder and cedar to, um, of course GCC uses totally different ones, um, but that's the, um, those, that's how it finds the libraries. That's how it finds the runtime support libraries when it actually wants to link. Um, the assembly and the C code libraries. Yep. Yeah. And, um, but it looks like I didn't provide the firmware here to actually show a build. Well, that's not very useful, is it? Uh, but at this point, I should be—I would just be able to type "make" um, here using this make file, right? And it uses the TI. Um, let me show you the commands in the make file, All right? So it uses the the CLPRU um, to to perform the, the compilation, and then the LNK PRU to perform the linking, and um, you also need this linker command file. So I recommend just copying one. Um, but this gives you the memory, that, that explains the memory map to the linker. So you know, things get, get hard linked to, to certain physical addresses. Um, so you need to, to provide that to the linker. Um, also setting up different regions uh, for, for register maps, for peripheral register maps. Um, so, so PRU code is basically runnable code, right? I mean, it loads the fixed address and it runs in a fixed address. It doesn't have any touch-ups in there anymore. That kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. From a binary format. Um, yeah, it, it does get it gets stored in ELF. Okay. Um, so if you um, if you if you parse it. <laughs> All right, it shows you that it is um, an elf um, with symbols, right? So you can, uh, all right. right. So you can actually look at the you can actually look at the symbol table and everything for the in the, in the elf file because it's just a it's just an elf file. Mm -hmm. And the the um, if you use the other firmware, if you use the uh, instead of using the remote proc, if you use the UIO PRUSS, then you need to have a parser that actually parses it and, and then loads it into chunks of memory. Mm -hmm. Whereas the kernel driver understands how to parse ELF. Okay. Right? Linux understands how to parse right. ELF binaries and just load them into their, the, do the fix ups and, and load them into the, the fixed memory addresses. And I don't think there actually are any real fix ups because I don't think this is a really relocatable code. Right. Um, well, I figure because you provided the linker table there, right? Because the linker is going to do that down, right? Yeah, um, but I mean, just the linker may provide symbols to still be resolved at, uh, at runtime. But I forget what NM tells you. Like what NM tells you, I think what symbols are actually still need to be resolved. But I, I don't think that any symbols need to be resolved okay. at load time. Um, well, since you provide, you, you showed us the firmware, right? It's not like it's a huge operating system that has, you know, millions of calls you can make. Yeah, there's no, it's yes. It's basically just a, a basic wow. piece of code that's running on the PRU. Exactly. So, yeah, this is your whole firmware right here. 
firmware, PRU0 firmware, then it also links in the syscall. Mm -hmm. um, this is the disassembly, right? So when you when you um, when you build it, you can look at the uh, um, the annotated this like the the this is, well this is, this looks like the, I, don't know this, I don't know if you ran the disassembler or if you ran the because um, you, you can have the C generate annotated C mm -hmm. um, the C compiler um, so it'll actually produce an assembly listing that's annotated with the C code the, the C code itself and generated um, so you can look this is the actual pure U assembly code. Yeah, that's the that's the machine code right there, the the offsite offset byte, the machine code, um, and then the mnemonic. And you see, the the pure U assembly isn't too too bad. Um, you know, uh, I don't know exactly what LBBO means, but uh, well, LSL is left shift left, right? So you have and. Uh, I'm sure that's that's some sort of store operation. That's some sort of load operation, um, but it's like doing some selective loads. Uh, uh, Q. So that's um. Different. That's branch not equal. Um, but Q. Uh, so that, that that's some sort of that's a that's a decision. Load byte burst. That's uh, LDB one. Right. And so. S so you can actually load a series. Bytes. So you can actually load. It's probably loading four bytes at a time, right? Through the four. Yeah, you can, and you can load registers, like because you can load. Um, so that may just like that may just be loading a single register, but you can actually load like a series of like four registers from memory, one after another. So it'll it'll inc automatically increment a few. So you can you can fill your register array with a, a with an array from memory. Hmm. Um, it's it's a, it's a pretty nice little assembly language. Um, to that you shouldn't use a register count of zero because it will hang it. You know, you know. On that load by burst, you can do two ways, like you said. You can load registers, right? And you do an account of how many registers to load. And right. You shouldn't use zero because then the PRU will hang. Oh, well, <laughs> you tell it to not load, to not you know, load, to load zero register. Yeah. It won't just do a no op. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it says, you know, mm -hmm. it's the TI, the processors that we see that TI that comes from. Well, then I would advise not doing that. <laughs> I can understand the pain of I, the guy that wrote the microcode. You know, I mean, do you want to put in an extra check for that, or do you just? If you tell I don't me you're stupid, I mean, I'm gonna be stupid. Yeah, I mean, I, you know. Maybe you want to hang the process. Right. <laughs> you awesome needed an extra halt instruction, <laughs> um, which it has a halt. Um, all right. Uh, sorry, is the, the the boss checking in? So, um, the we've gone probably way over half an hour over. Um, How's this? So, so what? What can I do to do this again and get more out of it? So, I I have some 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 code that that, that shows the like with the to try to do the, the LCE, oh, yeah. um, but just doing this from the from the pure you speak. Um, but but I had an issue with the AND instruction, so I was just doing trying to do uh, um, pure. I was trying to do comparisons of bits in order to um, to decide whether or not to. Shift to higher or low. Yeah, you're like, and this operation's not working right now. It's always saying that it's that and this and is always returning true. Right? So okay, it's so, always shifting out high bits. So okay, so so what you did today was you, you showed us how to get things sort of loaded up and, and one instruction running, but my light doesn't seem to work because I said it's both zero and one, and it's got the same dimness. Dimness. Wait, yeah, wait, wait, zero and one. Uh, well, you're just like. Oh yeah, because the PRU you're controlling the five volt dial assist five volt. So 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 okay. I don't have choice so much. Doesn't matter. Um, so what you what you did was you 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 know everything wasn't completely set up, which is okay. You showed us how to do a couple little steps, mm -hmm. and then for for the most part, you showed us how all the pieces fit together. You went out and looked at everything, and and uh, you know showed us how where all the different pieces work. So since this was sort of like a tutorial. 
you know, you could potentially send us this code since some of us, you know, I took some notes. If I can send the notes to people if you want, if they want. Um, and uh, with all the additional steps, you might be able to remember them and be able to repeat them. Um, and uh, just, you know, here's the bill. You could load this specific build up yeah, I somewhere. Yeah, I could give this specific build up. You know, you could be can short that load it somewhere. Short that stupid C TIC compiler. Maybe right. I shouldn't have dropped that on there. So, you, so you, you can show the instructions that you, you went through, and then you can also uh, that little program that you wanted to run. Well, on these, uh, I'm on, on this thing. So, so uh, um, that code's already on the image, but you can see instructions on how to run that code. So. Yeah. Well, it does, the, the AND instruction right now, it won't run. Right, but once you get it working, you could post it, tell us how to run it on top of the additional the instructions you have. And for those of us who've gotten these, obviously we need to know which pins to stick these into. So that too, so so uh, we can do this as sort of like a homework assignment. So that's sort of like... Well, is there a good, is there a good email thread that we, we can all follow on? Um, I don't know yeah. if it's... You can post it to the meetup with okay. like a, a link to the instructions or something. Okay. Well, as er everybody's on signed up on the meetup, right? Yeah. 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 All right. We'll and follow up on the meetup, and then for those who want to get it, you still have more of these, right? Yeah. yeah. If you, you want those, on that three too. Yeah, yeah I've got a, I've got several more of these little L LCD displays. So those of us who want to take this home with. Yeah, I was thinking that um, either a handout or a text file that you could access, so that if like if we fall behind on the um, like for me, I, I was a little bit behind because I got my IP address later and everything. So it'd be nice to be able to follow through the command without interrupting. Um, Put that either on the meetup or on the GitHub or something? Right. Well, if you're doing another class, you could have either a piece of paper that has the commands oh, yeah, yeah. or yeah. have it as a part of the image as a text file. So you have that text yeah. file, so you have this stuff. So maybe I can put, it in, put that text. So um, why, don't, why don't I clean up the image a little bit based on some of the feedback here? Um, maybe yeah. fix the bug. The Python library. Um, yeah, get the with a firmer source. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah. Don't don't vary too much from what you've already done here because we saw that so right. we sort of have an idea and it's good for us as people who are trying to learn it to do some of the steps. So you know. I won't. Yeah, I won't fix it up so it just it automatically runs. I'll make sure you still have to do the <laughs> yeah the and, couple of commands. What the steps are. We, of understand what they are. But know, include the text file, and maybe you, you can give me the first draft of the text file. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll clean it up and correct it. Sure, um, and then I'll post it up on, um, on S3 and every, so that everybody can download it from the. Um, Bash history helps too. And that's how this works. Yeah. So there are two different things. Actually, let me, let me, let me say my history right now. So we can I, I use that several times to make that was part of the process I've done. Or I can remember what I was doing before I correct my history. So I don't know if I was doing this, something this like this. Or, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It, it's um. Or yeah, I just switched out the keys. Like so a it wasn't the LED command. It's not the LED. Like we just like record yeah. everything that we do and put it in the text file. Um, so I don't know. We we can mm -hmm. hang around and debug here a little sure, bit. Sorry. But I think are we uh, any other kind of feedback as to how to make this better? What what did you not get out of it? What did I, the, I think it was really good. I mean, I had not done anything with Blown other than having one and browsed a little bit. But it answered a lot of my sort of really deep technical questions on like what this PRU thing is. Um, the next thing that I would do, and that's just me, is I would try to figure out how to do like what you said, access the A to D converters or something. Because like my goal is mm -hmm. getting some sort of pit loop or whatever running and I would need analog input, right? Uh, but that's, you know, not to say that what you presented here wasn't enough. There was more than enough for it. Uh, I think it was a really good, good overview of what you can do and how to do this, right? So there wasn't any, for me there wasn't any gaps in how it goes from the people going to the PRU to the fit of this thing. Perfect. So I'll just uh, continue to just get better at delivering this. But he's, he's going to make a new one. We might want to just wait for that. And then. But yeah, I mean, can we just insert there? No, this, uh, this is what you just get. Yeah. But if you want what you're running on, just like insert that disk and like DD from. Yeah, if you just DD from, from SD0 to SD1. 
Yeah, if you want an exact copy of that, I can, we can do that. What are the instructions? No, not with this. All right. All right. Thank you very much. And there's still more food, I think, as well. Thank you very much.